Good evening and welcome to Millennium Stage. Please give a warm welcome to Open Circle Theater and the Open Doors Festival. Everyone, um, thank you so much for being here at the Open Doors Festival. It has been such a great day, um, so I'm so glad you all are here. Uh, today we are celebrating the intersection of arts and disability, um, and we've had so many wonderful artists um, present movement classes, our arts market, a panel, cabaret performances, and now we're here at the Millennium Stage and live streamed wherever streams are live. Thank you uh, so much for the Kennedy Center for presenting this day in collaboration with Open Circle Theater, <laughs> and, and which we'll hear more about later. Um, I'm Amy Clausen, and as you might guess by this sparkly shirt and magenta pantsuit, I am your, your MC. Um, so first to give you some information about tonight's performance, uh, if you are joining us in person at the Kennedy Center and would like an assisted li listening device or audio description, please see an usher now. Uh, our interpreters uh, will be um, to your right, and our captions will be to your left. Uh, captions are also located on the screen above the stage. Uh, and a heads up, we will have some mature content and language uh, in tonight's performances. Uh, oh, everyone got really excited. <laughs> um, and to describe our stage, uh, it is really quite grand, I must say. It has light towers on either side that glow and change colors. Um, on stage to your left, there is a grand piano, and to your right, there is a keyboard, and we'll be moving some mics and stands around for the different performances. And speaking of performances, let's kick things off. Here to get, this, get us started is a medley. Anyone can whistle, that's what they say, easy. Anyone can whistle, any old day, easy. It's all so simple, relax, let go, let fly. So someone tell me why can't I? I can dance a tango, I can read Greek easy. I can slay a dragon any old week easy. What's hard? What's natural comes hard. Maybe you can show me how to let go. Lower my guard, learn to be free. Maybe if you whistle, whistle for me. Maybe if you show, show me how to let go. Lower my guard, learn to be free. Maybe if you whistle, whistle for me.
they blow. Onward to glory I go. Hear me, heathens and wizards and serpents of sin. All your dastardly doings are past. For a holy endeavor is now to begin, and virtue shall triumph at last. I am I, Don Quixote, the Lord of La Mancha, my destiny calls and I go, and the wild winds of fortune will carry me onward, oh, we Whithersoever they blow, whithersoever they blow, onward to glory, I go. says that my hook isn't cute. tricks in the book. Just little old me, Captain Hope. <laughs> so great. Thank you guys. <laughs> uh, so that was Scott Cedar singing, Aaron Logan signing, and Michael Crayville on piano. Um, so t yeah, another round of applause. <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> um, so tonight we're showcasing um, uh, local DMV artists who identify as disabled and or deaf in community with allies. 
And our next performer is a poet, a disability activist, and singer. She was a founding board member of the DC Women's Open Mic and Poetry Organization, Mother Tongue. She has competed on the National Poetry Slam circuit for several years and was the 2013 Beltway Grand Slam champion. Her work has appeared in multiple books, anthologies, journals, and online publications. Here to present a collection of poems is Natalie E. Illum. Hi everyone, I'm so honored to be here. Thank you so much. This first poem is called My Mother's Prayer. My mother has one wish for me, one daily mantra like good morning. She calls to me over long distances, don't fall, try not to fall down. Okay, I promise as though language mitigates condition, as though my lack of balance was semantics. So I put down the phone. Inside my head is a tripwire, a stuttering end game, a wild gesturing of genetics and alchemy. The equation of movement sounds like static, a spastic afterthought of normal encased in blue. I move forward through mud. I go down and pick up the metaphor for pain. I call the bruising persimmon, hold lightning in my synapses. I cushion the need for gravity. Falling is like flying, but the impact is not death. I expect an easy shattering, except I get up. I haul muscle and torn flesh into an approximation of walking a simulation of standing, a promise I broke to my mother who swears every time I crash and cold sweat threaten to break into my own skin. Every time I grow bruises like purple and yellow, yellow crocuses dying on my skin. She knows I have fallen and prays for me. This next poem is called, Why Most People Don't Like Feet. <laughs> My father is the planter's wart I had removed as a child. My mother's the bunion surgery I had two weeks after my brother's wedding, a shaving, a bone overdue. I can still feel the scalpel, the misplaced lidocaine, but you, you are the heart transplant I beg my body not to reject. Also the bloom, a malignancy in the chest that no medicine will excise or calm. No surgeon even knows how to cut. This next poem is, come, is called Some of Us Travelers. Um, I had surgery right before the pandemic started and I was still recovering during that. Some of us travelers, if you squint, the highways look like weakened arteries, the rivers are veins, a bypass through a small town could save your life. My body, is not a small town. I've seen the Pacific Ocean only once. You drove down Highway 101 from Oregon to San Francisco and we laughed at the lack of guardrails. When we argued, we threatened to drive off the edge, convinced only one of us could live. Push pins make me slightly angry now. Why hang a cork board full of places you won't get to? I've been in this room for 97 days. I am not mad at the sunlight. I can see 
the aloe plant someone else will water for me. I could stare long enough so that the curve of my bed rail becomes a mountain. We can say I'm in training for a marathon. The bathroom is the 5K mark. The grab bars form a highway from east to west. Just in case I can get out of bed, metaphors used to make this easier. Now I stick to the square footage of my body an exterminator once told me that mice prefer to move along the edges of things. They rarely go out into the open space of a living room. I do not think this is true. I am not a mouse. I have been in this room for 231 days. Both of my feet are the work of Frankenstein's doctors, but I will no longer say that thing about scars how they form some kind of map. I'm not telling you who stares most at which body part anymore or who stopped looking. The walls of this room are not depressed. There's a triptych of the ocean. I'm pretty sure it's the Pacific. On the left wall, a landscape of where my grandmother lived, an oil painting of Lyme Regis I found in a, rubber, in a rubbish shop. There's a river there, too. There's always a river that some of us can't swim in. Thank you. Two more quick poems. This one is called, um, this one is my homage to DC. It's called The 18th Street Lounge Stop Dancing After 29 Years. In DuPont Circle, the first place to flatline its DJs and drink specials, the Big Hunts comedians just stopped being funny. The Black Cats punk scene couldn't afford to be independent. We didn't riot the Capitol when our businesses took unpaid sick leave. We volunteered our sympathies, diagnosed our wallets with blood clots. We left some without inhalers, like we always do, changed the names of sidewalks while joggers ran unmasked. What do you learn here? The National Guard protects everything but the ventilators. This is supposed to be a poem about dancing. Who still knows how to tango? Who drank tequila or bleach instead? My best friend learned how to roller skate and black out while I YouTubed how to become a cardio expert from my wheelchair. This is what isolation is for. You should still be productive even from an ICU bed. Make a playlist while you wait, they told us. Someday we'll walk in the rays of the beautiful sun. Someday when this world is much brighter. I have one more poem. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone who put together the Open Doors Festival. It is long overdue. It is necessary for visibility and artistic expression. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, this is another poem about my family whom I love dearly. Uh, Thank you for listening. My fear of water came later. My family doesn't like the desert air. We prefer low tides to high altitudes, coastal highways to mountains. We don't ski. We charter. We choose our bait with precision. We don't let the lines go slack. We hunt the mako because we can. We don't relish a shoreline, we forget. We live so close to what most people would pay dearly for. We aren't moved by stunning sunsets. My father named his boat Bite Me. This isn't a joke. We made fun of my mother whenever she said, I specifically told you not to do that. She wasn't born here but she is a water sign, said if I'm drowning, I should. 
try to play dead and hope the Coast Guard finds me in time and face up. We don't fear the riptide we live in. We just call our flying dishes fish. We imagine all our broken glass finds its way into the Atlantic for some sweet kid to discover our arguments finally smooth enough to call treasure. Look how pretty we are now. The light hits us just right. Thank you. Oh my goodness, so beautiful. Can we give it up one more time for Natalie? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I love that. All right. Um, so our next performer is a pianist and a composer, an audio engineer on a mission to break boundaries and inspire others. As a pianist, she is known for her expressive playing and genre bending style that transports listeners to another time and place. Join me in welcoming to the stage, Shelby Block.
everyone, and I just want to say thank you also to the Open Doors Festival for having me. Uh, that piece was called Acadia. It's an original piece of mine. And again, I'm Selby Locke, so if you enjoyed my music, you can find me on Spotify, Apple Music, YouTube, wherever you listen to music. And uh, that piece, Acadia, it was inspired by a uh, summer I spent in Maine, including uh, a hike in Acadia National Park. And of course, I didn't know at the time that that would be the last summer I could physically do something like go for a hike. Three years ago, when I was in the middle of my second piano album, I got a virus and I never got better. I went from being a full-time conservatory student to barely being able to sit up for any length of time. And I was diagnosed with myalgic encephalomyelitis, ME, chronic fatigue syndrome, which is similar to long COVID. And unfortunately, with that diagnosis, there's not a lot that they can do. The advice is you need to just rest and wait and hope that you'll get better, that recovery, if it ever happens, will be a matter of time. And that's what the next piece is called. It's called A Matter of Time. And it's inspired by my journey through this condition and also there are a bunch of difficult rhythms in there. So the piece is really about finding hope when you're waiting for something that you're not sure is ever going to happen. And I, uh, I've spent the last three years uh, learning how to live my life as a disabled person. And I just want to make it clear that I'm not here because I overcame my disability. I'm here because I learned to thrive with it. So this is the matter of time.
can we get a uh, round of applause for who's gonna add Shelby to their playlist? Because I am, that is amazing. Um, awesome, all right, so our, our final performance is a play from DC's hottest new playwright. The playwright may or may not be me. Uh, <laughs> um, so we'll get the actors out here and then we are gonna hear from Open Circle Artistic Director Suzanne Richard, who brought us all together today. Um, and here's all her theater. Go for it, Susie. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for coming out here to the Open Circle Open Doors. Wait, no. This is the Open Doors <laughs> Festival, um, and I am with Open Circle Theater. Um, I am here because of the amazing program that the Kennedy Center started just before the pandemic started called the Culture Caucus which was really to try and bring the local community into, um, into the Kennedy Center um, and specifically the REACH. But it's an amazing program and I wanna make sure that they get the credit that they deserve, the my fellow Culture Caucus members and Trey and Mariana there in the Social Impact Office along with Rachel and Karina who do the Dance Sanctuaries which we did this morning as well with some dance things there. And I just wanna tell them they're awesome for doing this. Um, um, I really, really need to thank, though, three ladies who got up here, no, barely knew me. Jessica had known me just like a few months, and Amy and Reagan were like, who is this woman who is like, can you guys do all this work? Um, so Amy Clawson, our, our playwright who may or may not be the one who wrote this. <laughs> Jessica Wallach who ran around like a crazy woman with me for months <laughs> doing this stuff. And Reagan Linton, new to town, and yet we get to keep her. So thank you, <laughs> Reagan. Um, the tech here uh, at the Kennedy Center has been amazing. And of course, the access office with Betty Siegel and Emily and Windsor and the whole team have been, make the Kennedy Center one of the most amazing places to be if you're a person with a disability. Um, Open Circle Theater, our founding principle is that we are supporting and encouraging careers in the arts for people with disabilities. At the panel just the, uh, earlier today, I asked the question, how many wealthy and well-known artists with disabilities do you know? What? Uh, Marlene Matlin, uh, Peter Dinklage, uh, Marley Matlin, uh, <laughs> Peter Dinklage. If we're not getting to train, if we're not getting seen, if we're not even being really considered for roles, if our stories aren't being told, then how are we supposed to make a living? Well, I'll tell you how. Places like Open Circle Theater, festivals like the Open Doors Festival start showing people what we bring, what we represent, and how we can help change the world through what disability brings to society. So thank you all for being on the vanguard of that. And now I have the incredible joy and pleasure of being a part of this play reading by seriously one of DC's best new playwrights, Amy Clark. Ah, thank you. <laughs> um, awesome. Okay, well, uh, without further ado, uh, here is Little Blue. A Lighthearted Tale About Heavy Things by Amy Clausen. Music by James Russian. After Hans Christian Andersen. The play begins. Darkness. A single pearl of light. It flits about as if floating through water by the magic of an actor's hand. Projection. When we perish, we turn into mere foam of the sea. The Little Mermaid, 1837. Once upon a time, far out of the ocean, there lived a little mermaid and her sisters. I heard she dies in this play. She died? You don't know that. Today, the sisters are stealing something. Something that belongs to them. Wings is the scout, hand to air. 
something that's been locked away. Current is clear. They sneak through the castle. The sisters are all named after shades of blue. I play Sky, the sister in charge. I play Azure, the most beautiful. I play Periwinkle. Oh, you can call her Wink. It's Periwinkle, the sister who's most afraid, but best at sensing monsters. Boo! Boo. <laughs> hey. No dallying. Like all mermaids, we glide about on our fins. Along the scalloped ceilings of the great hall. Taking cover behind enormous chandeliers. Made of living muscles opening and closing in the current. Until we reach the, the, the vault. The door's been left open, only just a hair. Invisible, unless you're looking. Spread out, uh, but not too far. Oh, and I play Little Baby Blue. Little holds a buff. The youngest. The sister who feels everything so deeply, so much, that sometimes it leads me. The pearl is seen again. Little follows Edith as it flits around the stage. Little, where'd you go? She was too eager to come into the world. So she was put back into a seahorse until she was fully cooked. We call her Little. But her heart was born big size, which is too big for her. Little slammed her open book over the pearl, trapping it. She listens to its song. It is astonishing. Nose in your book. Little hides the pearl in her kiss. Come on. I found it. The sisters run to ask her to discover a chest. Well, grab it. Let's go. Asher and Wink grab the chest. Back through the tunnel, swerving through the chandeliers, in through the bedroom window. Inside the walls of girls' bedrooms, many secrets lie. Some secrets our father wouldn't like. They drop the chest. Hammer. Hammer. Sky hammers the chest lock. Notice how I move away from my sisters. Nose in my book, a pearl tightly in my fist. The youngest is strange. Stubborn. Thoughtful. And the most dangerous of teenage attributes. Curious. Curious. I wish you wouldn't read that. Uh, she likes it. Especially page 120. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to be happy to break open my mother's things. But unlike my sisters, I cannot. I wish I could unsnap my corset and pull out my too big heart. Let it rest from my mother's memory, my father's sadness, my sister's too quick normalness. Carve it out with a knife just to have a vent to exhale. Little listens to her pearl song. This song makes her heart calm. But it's hardly a thing you mention in polite company. Got it! They open the chest. Mother's dresses! Her green ball gown. Oh, the embroidery. Oh, the detail. Feels like her. <laughs> oh, and here's Mother's comb with the silvery pearl. The three lean in to listen. While they're listening, let's explain something. Lilla shows her hidden pearl to the audience. These pearls, when mermaids die, they fall away into sea foam. But some bubbles transform and become pearls of wisdom, each singing a lesson from their heart. It sings. Sisters are different flowers from the same garden. <laughs> Mother always loved that song. The three listen again to the mother's pearl, full of joy. The best pearls, the ones 
that grandmothers have deemed good become beautiful jewelry, the most precious of ornaments. You should have the poem. Yeah? Yeah. I do, but the comb in Skye's hair little listens to the pearl in her own hand. Not everyone hears pearls the same way. Some pearls are dangerous, they say. Some will lead you down the wrong path. But what if what's bad makes you feel? Little hides the pearl from Skye's. If you wanted to put that book down, I could tell you some real human stories about the surface. Mermaids can't go to the surface until they're 16. I'm only 15, unlike my sisters who are... 16, 17, 18. Our parents really wanted a boy. <laughs> when I was Guy on the surface... Sits, uh, guy sits on the bed with little. When I was on the surface... I saw a naked man. You saw a statue. Male, naked. You have a better story? Little jumps up to the other side of the room. Unfortunately for Skye, I'm known for my stories. When finally I surface, it will be in winter. The North Lights will dance, teal hued in their shimmer. My sisters will clinch jeweled clams to my fins. Uh, their beauty will feel like hot blood, knives, and pins. Little begins unclasping her corset. But oh, when the sailors do see me at last, they'll sail to my iceberg, mouths wide and steadfast. They'll croon out bold shanties, full force from their chest of the mermaid they loved at first glimpse of her breast. Whoosh! <laughs> Little pretends to flash the breast. She's wearing a slip beneath. <laughs> oh, will you wear one of Mother's ribbons for these sailors? Who cares? They'll be looking at her lady bits, apparently. <laughs> or maybe I'll play the siren who sings the sweet song of the sea, pretending to be the innocent maiden but rips out men's throats with her teeth. Rawr! <laughs> the Odyssey? <laughs> Don't you ever read? Oh, you mean your exquisite literature like the Rook on Horseback. <laughs> Guy grabs the book again. Careful, the pages are getting soft. The Rook held her in place by the hips as he dismounted the horse but not before Lady Elaine felt the graze of his quivering manhood. Give it back. You know, I think Little's a pervert. <laughs> but don't be a pervert, that's how you get worms. The Rook then kissed her repeatedly, warming her from the inside, yet bringing chills at the same time. Only he had the power to make her squirm down there. Whatever. Whatever is girl speak for fuck you. His knife sliced through her corset strings in a deft motion, Give it back. leaving her nipples exposed and erect. Give it You're back. Right. I think I have a lot to learn. Give from it this. back! Little grabs the book. Whoa. All right. Little takes the ripped page back. This book is the best thing that's dropped in years. I'm going back to the garden. Open your hand. What? I can hear it from here. You have a pearl. Will you let me keep it? Can I hear its song first? Little listens to her pearl. It's not a bad one. Sky listens. It sings. All things fade with time, except for grief. Why are you obsessed with these sad songs? I want it back. No. Here, come try one of Mother's dresses on. Give it back. Uh, you look so nice. I'm not trying on the dress. I'm asking for this one thing. You know, Mother always said, all good mermaids become daughters of the air for the soul's of the kind are never lost. 
mother would want you to be part of the world. Come back, sweet sister. I'm not bothering anyone. Why are you trying to dictate everything we do? I'm sorry, this is for your own good. Sky opens the window. No. Sky, please, no. Sky releases the pearl. It slips away towards the deep ocean. Sky throws the windows shut. Let me get it. Little tries to go out the window. Her sisters hold her back. It'll be okay. Please, let me go after it. They try to pull Little in. Oh, I might like to take a knife to carve out my too big heart and hold it above the waves, uh, above my mother's memory, above my father's sadness, above my sister's secrets, so I might, so I might. You okay? Get off me! Little pushes her. Sisters away, she is seething. Oh, it's not that big a deal. Little Yank's mother's comb out of Sky's hair. Ow! I'm bleeding. Little holds the comb up, a standoff between her and Sky. We can all hear them, you know. The other pearls you're hiding, we were trying to be nice. Little takes the hammer and smashes the comb's pearl. Oh my god! I'm sorry. Sky takes the book. Give me that trash. Sky tears it up. I didn't mean to. You know what takes ba bravery? Healing. Taking the world as it is and moving on. The other pearls, I want them gone. Sky leaves. Little holds the pieces of her destroyed block. If you thought this was the kind of story where sisters hurt each other, then heal at the end, you were mistaken. Sisters hurt, and they don't take back. End of scene. Thanks so much, you guys. All right, that is our show, folks. So thanks so much for joining us. And we have one final event for the day, which is a music and mingle. So here's some music, get to know each other down at the River Pavilion that way. Um, and we'll see you there. Keep a lookout on the tables uh, to sign up for Open Circle Theater's mailing list. And when you share about us, use the hashtag OpenDoorsFest and have a wonderful evening. Thanks, all. Thank you for joining.